Hey everyone, welcome back to Mr. Geopolitics. And today we're going to be looking over the latest developments in Ukraine. So finally, the Ukrainians have launched their much anticipated um, counteroffensive towards Kherson in the south. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, the results on the first day. Uh, I'm going to try to make this a quick update. Um, so one thing to, I, have to, I should mention is on uh, what people refer to the Zelensky line or the battle for the Donetsk uh, region and the Donbass. It seems from a recent video that the Wagner Group released that um, basically the uh, the Russians, the Wagner Group, has taken over uh, Kodima, Kodima, yeah, Kodima in uh, close to uh, Bakhmut, and um, the Russians already control Dacha and Zaitseve. So now they've pretty much uh, filled a filled a gap kind of uh, here, and they can now, if if they want, they can proceed towards um, the town of uh, Kurdiam Kurdiamivka, Kurdiamivka, and by doing this, they will cut off Bakhmut and uh, all the rest of the cities like um, Kramatorsk and Sloviansk and Seversk, Solidar, all of they're going to cut off all of those that entire region from uh, the southern portion uh, where you see New York and all these little towns here so that, that will give them the option to proceed towards New York and uh, they can do that from multiple directions. Um, anyways, that's that's about it f for the uh, Donbass front. Um, everyone's focusing on the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive. So before they launch this counteroffensive. Uh, the Ukrainians un unleashed a barrage of artillery and rockets. Uh, they reportedly hit a bunch of uh, ammunition depots. And uh, they claim they uh, struck uh, gatherings of uh, Russian troops or army barracks. Uh, I'm not sure how successful those strikes were, but... Um, they again struck the Anto Antonivka Bridge, but uh, the Russians are constructing uh, a temporary barge bridge. And uh, looking at this river crossing right here, um, a lot of the Russian tanks and armored vehicles, they can actually most likely cross, cross uh, make this crossing anyways. Um, I'm pretty sure T. Mo, I'm pretty sure T72s uh, and mo, BMPs. Um, a lot of Russian armored vehicles and uh, tanks uh, can actually uh, go through shallow water, so there's another option for them there. Of course, going over a bridge is easier, but. Uh, Anyways, both sides are controlled by the Russians, so I mean, the barge bridge they can uh, easily just, you know, not even take any risk, just spread out all their forces and just go over maybe one or two uh, vehicles at a time. And some armored vehicles can also cross over, just um, I've heard it's not hard to set up the, the, the tanks for a river crossing it just takes a few minutes so they can do that as well um, so the Ukrainians um, struck different areas in Kherson 
uh, and then they launched their counteroffensive. Um, so the Ukrainians, uh, I believe Zelensky claims that they captured six villages in their first day, but the Russians claim that uh, the Ukrainian uh, offensive or the counteroffensive was a complete failure. Right here, um, where you see the M14 highway, the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians actually made it all the way to uh, Kiselivka. And uh, reportedly, they occupied Kiselivka until the Russian uh, reinforce, reinforcements arrived and forced them out. So either it was a trap from the beginning or the Russian reinforcements came. Either way, the Ukrainians uh, reportedly had to retreat with heavy losses. So that's that. Um, there's fighting all along the front, uh, right here. Uh, for this this village, for example, which is a couple of streets, Lubomirivka. So there's fighting all along the front, all along the front line, um, all the way from uh, Alex Alexandrivka, right here. I'll show you there here. And this town seems to switch hands. Uh, it switch. It it has switched uh, hands on multiple occasions. Uh, one day the Russians control it, one day the Ukrainians control it, so um, who knows what's going on, but um, maybe the Ukrainians have taken control of it, but anyways, the, the front stretches uh, all the way, um, all the way from Alexandrivka to the top here. No... Novo Vorod Voront Sovka. Yeah, I know I'm butchering these names, but uh, so I'll just draw the line for you. So So the front pretty much stretches for about 200 miles or 300 kilometers. Um, anyways, the only area where the Ukrainians have had uh, success, any real success, it's hard to see because all these, uh, the Russians have... Uh, as you can see they've gone ballistic like with their shelling right now just zooming out you can see that all these red symbols here all these clusters the Russians are just going just going ballistic on the Ukrainians and they've been shelling this area for the for the last few uh, for the last few months because um, the Ukrainians have been talking about launching a counteroffensive for months now, right? First they said June, then they said July. Now it's at the end of August. And we're approaching fall and then winter, so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there was some fighting behind the scenes or some struggle, power struggles or whatnot because uh, Zelensky did purge a lot of uh, some of his top officials who were actually seem to be pretty loyal but um anyways um the, the russians have launched it seems missiles at mikolaev explosions audible in mikolaev and a few people were killed with russian shelling but the russians are not so much targeting infrastructure like the ukrainians the Russians seem to be more focused on targeting military military targets, and uh, when the Ukrainians target infrastructure, 
it's tempting to for the Russians to re return fire and hit Ukrainian infrastructure, but I mean, the Russians could pretty much turn the power off in most of Ukraine if they wanted to. They could launch missiles, I mean, pretty much anywhere in Ukraine, and they could pretty much turn the power off, turn the water off in a lot of cities. But you gotta, you have to remember that there, that that Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union and before that the Russian Empire and that there are a lot of ethnic Russians in Ukraine uh, so the Russians are trying to uh, they're trying to stick to their goals and uh, that's a smart thing to do because uh, in World War two actually when the when when uh, when the Nazis were going on the blitz against London at one point the because the Germans were so focused on military targets, at one point, the uh, the, uh, the the U the the uh, English the UK forces uh, their air force and their military their infrastructure was on the verge of collapse. So what did they do? They tried to. They knew Hitler was an emotional man, and uh, and one night they struck. Um, civilian targets in uh, Berlin and then in a night raid and this enraged Hitler to the point where he stopped focusing on the uh, UK military and uh, he started focusing more on uh, Brit British, British civilian targets and this allowed the military some breathing space the Air Force some breathing space and uh, apparently that's one of the reasons why they even survived. If the Germans would have just stayed focused on military targets they might have even won that campaign. But the Russians don't seem to be taking the bait they're just uh, with most of their air, uh, most of their shelling and uh, you can see that it's just in the, it's just military targets whether it's counter battery fire or um, whether it's ammo depots or whether it's gathering of Ukrainian troops um, anyways the only uh, area where the Ukrainians have had d definite 100 percent success is they've taken uh, this village which is called Suki Stavok okay so they took this village and um, now some reports are saying that because of Russian shelling, because this whole area is so flat, that uh, the Ukrainians were forced to retreat, actually, because the uh, Russians began targeting them. Uh, but, you know, the thing is about this village is that, as you can see, it's um, it doesn't seem to be any infrastructure in this village, and... I think it's just a village by name. It seems more like an intersection. Maybe a truck stop. Maybe it's a gas station. I don't know, but that's what Ukraine has. Uh, both both sides, uh, both um, pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian sources agree that the Ukrainians have taken the this village. Um, if you can even call it that. Um, the Ukrainians are also trying to um, encircle this village right here, which is called Blaho David. Blaho David, David, David uh, butchering these. Let's just call it Blaho Dativka. Blaho David Dativka. So they're trying to encircle and uh, cut off this village, but. Uh, it remains to be seen if they're going to be able to with Russians sending the re their reinforcements. And um, I guess we're going to find out sooner or later whether the, the Ukrainians were actually able to hold on to uh, this territory right here. Um, the Ukrainians are actually telling what they're saying is that uh, all their supporters, their they've told all their supporters to keep information in the dark so don't let so not to let the enemy know where they are or what they've taken but um, 
that makes it that makes the situation even more confusing uh, because then the Ukrainians make a claim but then they won't show proof because they're saying that you know we have this tactic of keeping everything in the dark or whatever but it's not like the Russians don't know what they've what villages or towns they ought they have control over or, or not so I don't think yeah I, I mean if Ukrainian troops can be precisely geolocated okay that's different but I mean if you take a town you you would think that you know if it's well these villages are really nothing especially these kind of villages like this one but if you take a couple I mean you think you would want to show some kind of proof but um, I don't know the Ukrainians are just doing things the way they're doing it um, interestingly enough in the last um, in the last uh, about a week ago the Russians they actually took a uh, pretty much this territory right here all this territory like all this territory uh, you see on this line right here so they took all this and uh, they didn't even make a fuss about it no one even reported on it but I mean this is a pro-Ukrainian source map right the owner of this map the creator is Ukrainian so he, I mean he's I mean they've even um, admitted it so yeah the Russians have taken this territory uh, just last week and so far the Ukrainians have only taken this territory now in terms of losses um, apparently the Ukrainians um, according to the Russians the Ukrainians lost um, more than 500 uh, troops as casualties and um, according to Russian sources in uh, Mykolaiv and in Kriviri, the hospitals are urging people to donate blood because uh, they're short on blood. Now that either means that there was some uh, that um, there is some incompetence in or lack of uh, preemptive. Uh, you know, it, it either if they're low on blood, either it's because of incompetence, bad planning, or because the Ukrainians have sustained a lot more uh, casualties and injuries than they uh, anticipated. So the, that's what the Russians are saying. The Ukra some Ukrainian sources are saying a Russian a thousand Russian soldiers have been killed. And um, the Ukrainians have lost one soldier. Um, I don't know how you can take that seriously, but the Russians are saying the Ukrainians lost uh, something like 26 or 28 tanks, 16 armored vehicles. The Russians also shot down two Su-25s and one, I believe it's a Mi-8 helicopter, a transport helicopter. So, and we know the Ukrainians are low on um, armor and um, equipment. So, you know, dozens of tanks and armored vehicles is not, and in the first day for them to sustain 500 casualties um, and gain really nothing except, you know, a street. Let's see, where is that again? Um, for them to definitively gain a street for all those losses um yeah i don't know it remains to be seen if the ukrainians are going to be able to sustain the the, the uh, this uh, offensive or if it's gonna just go on for a week or a few days or maybe they're gonna keep trying for a few weeks um but who knows? Um, because the, they they've had some counteroffensive. They've attempted some counteroffensives uh, towards Kherson in the past, but they've all fizzled out. So um, basically, only time will tell um, 
who's telling the truth because the Ukrainians are saying that you know the Russians are on the run and they liberated six villages but the, the thing is last week the Russians in this area that they took I mean you can count your, for yourself they liberated or took occupied however you want to think about it something like 20 settlements like all these settlements they were able to take uh, so and that was within a you know 24 hour period and they didn't make a fuss about it so the Ukrainians um, you know they've launched this much anticipated counteroffensive, and they've taken six villages they're saying but they you know both sides are only confirming one um, I don't know what to say this is some alternative uh, universe type, type shit going on right now and uh, we're just going to have to wait and see anyways um, yeah if we look all across the line the, the Russians are just yeah they're just they're even going on um Seems they're going on a counteroffensive in this area towards uh, Visokopilia. So the Russians seem to be launching counteroffensives of their own after repelling the Ukrainians. Uh, there's been more shelling at the uh, Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant. I don't know what Ukraine's end goal is with this. I mean, the Russians have made it clear that they're going to cut off the power to Ukraine and they're going to transfer the power to their own uh, their own uh, their own regions the regions they control and uh, it seems that the Ukrainians keep shelling this 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 this, this, this nuclear plant and uh, from what I've heard, Soviet nuclear, nuclear plant plants were built uh, to a pretty high standard in terms of uh, in terms of how sturdy they are. Apparently, uh, if an airplane from 10 kilometers in the sky were to fall on this plant, it would still not cause a catastrophic uh, destruction of the plant. So. Um, the planet would still be fine, apparently. So, um, but the Ukrainians keep shelling this this um, this plant, which, if you ask me, is playing with fire. And uh, the Russians have, uh, in response, they've beefed up their air defenses. They've militarized. They've sent more troops to the to the area. Um, and uh, they seem the Russians seem to be determined to just go ahead with their plans because I mean, if the Ukrainians end up damaging this this the power plant, I mean, not only will uh, the power get cut off for their their regions that they control, but also um, I'm talking about like catastrophic damage. Well, if it's really catastrophic. Um, then it, it might cause uh, radioactive uh, radioactive clouds to go into the air and if the uh, wind blows north I mean that would be very detrimental to the Ukrainians but I think they're uh, th they're not intent on destroying the nuclear plant and causing that uh, catastrophic destruction I think they just I think what they're trying to do, their end game, is to just bring world attention to the plant. The IAEA is apparently going to visit the plant soon, and it seems that the uh, the, the the Europeans and the IAEA, it seems that they're both um, on the same side. The IAEA is supposed to be a neutral body, but um, they're anything but neutral. I mean, look how much. Um, how, how much attention they put on Iran and then they don't even uh, they don't even dare point a finger at Israel right and we all know the Israelis have nuclear warheads they have an undeclared nuclear uh, program so they're not 
impartial or neutral. Um, I think the IAEA is just a tentacle of the EU and the West, if anything, because the IAEA is saying what they're saying is that, hey, let us take over this area. Uh, get your military out of this area. Let us take over this the the, the facility, and uh, we're gonna keep uh, feeding power to the uh, to the same areas as usual. But the Russians, they're saying no, that uh, this is their power plant now, and that uh, they're determined to cut the power to the Ukrainian uh, occupied regions and uh, connect it to the Russian power line. So the IAEA is going to visit the plant soon. Um, I don't think the Russians are going to um, evacuate the site because, um, I mean, they're not stupid. They know that, um, sure, it's risky, but they know that you, the Ukrainians... Um, or if if they really do destroy the site or try to destroy it, they would they would pretty much put themselves at just as much risk as uh, the Russian occupied areas, which are by the way, all these occupied areas the Ukrainians officially consider their own citizens. So by striking at this nuclear power plant, they're just endangering their own citizens, whether. They control the areas, or the, or the Russians control the areas. Officially, all these people are their citizens, right? So, um, it seems like they're just. It seems like the Ukrainians have this mentality where they're just uh, lashing out, and they're saying, and they're basically trying to send the message that, you know what, if uh, if you cut the power to us. We're not going to let you have it either. Um, I don't think they're going to cause the catastrophic destruction of the plant, but they're just going to keep shelling the plant and uh, trying to scare off the workers and disrupt. Um, and they're going to keep trying to disrupt um, the uh, operations so the Russians can't have the power either. Which is... Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say th about that because, I mean, winter is coming up and it would be tough for the Ukrainians um, in these regions like Zaporizhia, for example, not to have uh, electricity being provided to them by this plant. But at the same time, I mean, um, isn't it better for half of your or some of your people to have, even if it's Russian-occupied territory, isn't it better for some of your people who are oppressed and occupied to have some power than nobody? I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, it just seems like they're lashing out. But um, in any case... Um, this is uh, early on in the in the uh, counteroffensive, so we're gonna have to wait and see how it uh, turns out. Uh, but so far, the Russians seem to be holding their own. Um, one thing I should mention is that um, this whole counteroffensive might actually be just a, just a diversionary tactic because uh, supposedly the Russians. And the Chechens, well, the Chechens have twenty thousand troops there that they uh, that they that their leader uh, Katerov said he was sending into Ukraine. Twenty thousand. Population of Chechnya is one point four million. Pop population of Russia is one hundred forty million. So if the Chechens can muster up twenty thousand troops, your guess is as good as mine. How many troops the Russians can muster up? Supposedly, the Russians are saying they're sending 15,000 troops. But um, I, 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 the numbers just don't add up to me. I would think that um, because uh, according to reports, the Russians are offering really um, hefty, hefty bonuses. And uh, especially compared to before, they're offering 
soldiers who are willing to fight in Ukraine, people, soldiers who have people who have prior military experience, they're offering them uh, hefty sums compared to before. And the ruble is at a five-year high too. So, and uh, also another thing is conscription in Russia is mandatory. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. So there are a lot of uh, there's a, a, a large potential, p- and and Russians are patriotic people, and uh, according to polls, the majority support the war. So the Russians should should have a large potential pool to uh, fill their ranks, and they're saying it's only fifteen thousand troops, but uh, deception is part of the uh, it is part of the art of war as well I don't think the Chechens are, I don't believe the Chechens are sending 20,000 while the Russians are sending 15,000 troops but anyways uh, reportedly these troops that the Russians are sending are really well armed and they haven't been trained for a few days or a few weeks like some Ukrainian conscripts they've been trained for 6 months since uh, March so March, April, May, June, July, August so they're ready to go now and they've been given some of the best equipment that Russia has. They've been given T-80s, T-80 tanks, T-90 tanks. And they've been trained with Iranian drones. And they have hundreds of drones apparently. So I'm, an, I'm of the opinion that um, this Russian force is probably closer to, some, to something like maybe 50,000 troops. That would make sense to me or more. I mean, if you just consider the population of Chechnya and Russia and how much troops Chechnya has been able to muster, um, and you consider the Russians, Russia's population, and, you know, there's report, reportedly Ru- the Russians are... Uh, well, this is from the UK ministry, which uh, said uh, that the Russians were running out of missiles, I don't know, five months ago now, six months ago now, but... They're saying that the Russians are so desperate to fill their ranks that they're even recruiting prisoners. Well, that hasn't been proven yet, but what has been proven for sure is that uh, the Ukrainians have definitely done that because the Kraken group, the Kraken uh, group, which uh, are the Russians label as neo-Nazis, they, uh, they're known to torture and kill prisoners. They don't go by the Geneva Convention. And uh, apparently they're all former prisoners. Um, and they're given, um, you know, they're approached in prison and they're told that uh, they'll be offered a pardon if they sign a contract to fight in the war. And uh, they're offered a salary as well in some cases. So a lot of them are sitting in jail. They have prior military experience as well. So they say, hey, hey, why not? Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I don't know if the Russians have done that yet. But um, anyways, uh, this um, counteroffensive in Kherson might be a ploy to buy time. To to because imagine if the Russians send fifty thousand troops plus twenty thousand Chechen troops all into the Donbass, all into the Donetsk area. And the Russians have established um, some footholds, right? So, right, like here and um, in, in Piski, uh, now Adivka, uh, which is a heavily fortified Ukrainian town, is at the risk of being encircled. So the Russians have made some headway. Kodima just... Uh, day or so ago um, yeah they have a foothold and um, you know 50,000 plus troops well trained well armed troops would definitely make a huge difference it would be pre- I'm pretty sure it would be only a matter of time and uh, the Russians would take the entire uh, Donetsk region if they sent all of them there um but then, uh, at the same time, with the Russians putting pressure on this this area here, then uh, that has to uh, 
be alarming for the Russians, right? The Russian because the Russians don't want to lose this territory either, right? Their final goal actually is to reach um, Transnistria, which is a breakaway enclave of uh, Moldova, which is pro-Russian. And so, um, if I were the Russians, what I would do is I would split the troops in half. I would say, okay. Um, I have 70,000 troops all together. 35,000 go to uh, the Donbass. 35,000 go to the Kherson region and um, launch a counteroffensive against Zelensky's counteroffensive. And uh, this is a really pivotal moment for Ukraine because. Um, They've been hyping up this counteroffensive for months. And if it fizzles out or fails, or if the Russians actually turn, you know, launch their own counteroffensive and take territory uh, and and head towards Mikolaev and you maybe even take Mikolaev or surround it, that would be um, very detrimental to Zelensky's uh, political career. I mean, a lot of people would lose confidence in... Um, in him, um, apparently, right now he still has high uh, rankings in the polls, approval ra ratings in the polls. He's a good orator. He's a good speaker. He's a good actor. Um, but uh, you know, even if this, um, even if this, even if this, uh, uh, this, this highly anticipated counteroffensive fails. I have a feel. I have a feeling that the uh, Ukrainians are going to say that oh, it was just a psych ops, psych ops, just to uh, divert uh, the newly arrived arriving uh, Russian troops away from the Donbass. But that's a double-edged sword, right? Because, like I said, the Russians can just split that force they have in half, and. Uh, and even if they don't send the split in half, if the Russians experience success in either the this front, the Kherson Mikolaya front, or in the Donbass, uh, Donetsk region, um, I mean the Ukrainians at some point are going to have to uh, concede defeat, right? I mean, like if if the Russians are able to. Um, they don't even have to take Mikolaev, but if they can just reach Transnistria and establish a solid bridgehead, and it's pretty far, and it's, a qu it's quite a task, but if there's a winter offensive, um, you see all these uh, rivers that are in the way, the Ukrainians can blow all the bridges they want, but all, the, all these rivers are going to be frozen. Um, so... And not only that, but like I said before, um, a lot of Russian tanks and um, armored vehicles and equipment can do river crossings, so um, it, it all depends. Um, I think uh, we're going to have to wait and see what happens, but if the Russians can reach Transnistria, there's four to 6,000 Russian peacekeeping troops there. Um, so then they can expand uh, their center of influence from there. Um, so if they take that and they take uh, the Donetsk region, uh, the next targets would be uh, Kriviri, which is Zelensky's hometown, and Zaporizhia, which they could attack from uh, both sides. and. Um, one thing I should mention is that if the Russians want to stop the Ukrainians from bombing uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear p power plant, what they would have to do is divert, they would have to divert some forces uh, to this way, north, and then east, and take something like this, like a chunk of territory like this. And if they're able to do that, uh, yeah, sure, the Ukrainians can still bomb the 
Zaporizhia power plant, but they're good. I mean, uh, you know, some 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 of the artillery won't have the range for it anymore. Uh, so it's just going to make it more difficult, right? The further away the target is, the harder it is. The less accurate um, the hit might actually be. So um, that's one thing the Russians uh, probably have on their mind. Uh, again, they don't have to take the city of Nikopol, for example. All they have to do is surround it. Um, surround it and uh, surround it, just wait and then slowly uh, strangulate it, suffocate it as you know, civilians want to leave eventually because you know, civilians don't want to be bombed, uh, they want access to food, they want to live so then the Russians can set up humanitarian corridors out of the city and then that leaves only the uh, Ukrainian troops and then time is going to be against them because the Russians are going to keep bombarding them bombing the shit out of them their food stores their food supplies even like their ammunition and everything and then eventually just like what happened in Mariupol eventually they'll break um Anyways, uh, this quick update has turned into a long update, but uh, for those of you who've watched till the end, I hope you've enjoyed it. So anyways, please like and subscribe to grow the channel, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.